There's been a lot of talk in my country, Britain, about what relationship the left should have with patriotism. Whether we should reject it as purely reactionary, a tool wielded by the ruling class to divide us as workers, or take pride in our country, pose in front of the flag and praise the empire to shore up support from, from a mythologized white working class. Now this is obviously a touchy subject, but I feel that by looking at history we can see how past socialist experiments have assessed patriotism. Now, as I mainly talk about the GDR, it'll be no surprise that that's the country we'll be looking at today. But we can draw some clear comparisons here. Both Britain and Germany are traditionally seen as Western countries, and both have incredibly dark histories as imperialist powers. So, by looking at the GDR, we can evaluate if socialists today can use patriotism as a positive tool, not by waving a flag and making vague notions towards how great the nation is, I'm looking at you Sir Keir Starmer, but instead as a means to enable people to come to terms with their nation's dark history while celebrating the monumental achievements of the working class in their struggle for a better society. So without further ado, let's, talk, let's, let's take a look at how the GDR constructed its concept of socialist patriotism. So to create socialist patriotism, the idea of the, J of the German nation had to be completely overhauled. Gone was the ethnic focus on German-speaking peoples, and in its place was a pride in the workers' and peasants' state, its institutions and the classes it represented. The new Germany was to be a culmination of centuries of workers' and peasants' struggle, the self-styled first socialist state on German soil. However, the focus shifted across the 40 years of the GDR. Upon its founding in 1949, its goal was a socialist reunification of Germany, the GDR being the only legitimate German state. In 1961, as the division of Germany became permanent, the GDR referred to itself as the socialist state of the German nation, whilst the West was still divided by class. It was only from the 70s with Ostpolitik that the GDR uh, recognised two equal German states. Rightly or wrongly, it was an acceptance of peaceful coexistence with the West. But this video will mainly focus on the later years of the GDR, as it's a period when its national character was most developed, and lets us effectively assess its successes and failures. In her book, Honecker's Children, Anna Saunders outlines four key aspects of socialist patriotism in the GDR. Historical consciousness, militarism, the hostile enemy, and proletarian internationalism. Firstly, historical consciousness. The GDR classified history into two groups, legacy, meaning the wider history of Germany, warts and all, and tradition, meaning the struggle of workers, peasants and anti-fascists on which the GDR based its legitimacy. This meant establishing a new idea of the German nation built on a working class tradition, taking pride in the working class history of Germany rather than the idea of Germany itself. Key moments and groups celebrated in tradition were the Peasants' War, the Wars of Liberation against Napoleon, the Spartacist Uprising, the Red Army of the Ruhr, the Bavarian Soviet Republic, the Red Front Fighting League against Hitler and the Telemann Column of the International Brigades. As well as this, revolutionaries who were murdered on the front lines for the cause of anti-fascism and a socialist republic became martyrs. Particular heroes included Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Liebknecht, Ernst Telemann and Hans Beimler. Streets, schools, army barracks, parks and other public places were named after these revolutionaries to keep their memory alive in the people's consciousness. Mem members of the resistance to the Nazis regularly gave talks to schools and all students were required to visit Buchenwald concentration camp to be educated on the Holocaust, enforcing the message of never again. The history of the GDR itself was also central. Events such as the founding of the GDR in 1949, the building of the wall in 1961, and key SED party congresses were celebrated, whilst darker chapters such as, say, the 1953 Rising were still covered, albeit not to the same extent as other moments. The goal of, raising, uh, of a raising of historical consciousness was to ensure East Germans were knowledgeable of their past, seeing themselves as agents in history whilst bearing the torch of a long tradition of working class struggle into the future with the construction of socialism. The second feature was what Saunders referred to as militarism, which sounds scary for sure, but what is meant by this is the armed defence of peace, the socialist fatherland and the wider socialist community of nations. The National People's Army or the NVR was, was never once used in an aggressive war, 
For example, choosing to not engage in the Czechoslovakian crisis of 1968, unlike the rest of the Warsaw Pact. And the SED's 11th Party Congress affirmed that, quote, military service in socialism is a peace service. However, like almost every other country at that time, military service remained compulsory due to the high tensions of the Cold War. Although for its first six years it was purely voluntary, unlike the Bundeswehr, which was established a year earlier. Every man was conscripted for a minimum of 18 months in the NVR, with the option to extend this to three years or even make a career out of it. As pacifism grew in the 80s, more took the option of conscription into civil roles such as construction as Bausoldaten or non-combative work in the NVR, such as being medics or signalers. Although encouraged, nobody was ever forced to pick up a rifle. The state also encouraged rock concerts and protests for peace against NATO aggression, which proved overwhelmingly popular. Military education was also common in schools, especially after the late 70s with the breakdown of relations between East and West. The Society for Sport and Technology, or the GST, gave lessons in shooting as part of the, as part of the sports on offer, which prepared kids for their military, military service. This could be seen as something akin to cadets here in Britain. However, one major critique of the NVR and the GDR as a whole was its retention of Prussian military traditions and uniforms similar to that of the Wehrmacht. This was encouraged by the USSR when the NVR was set up in 1956, as it said that German soldiers should look like Germans rather than copying Red Army kit. This meant that for ceremonial duties, the NVR wore grey uniforms and goose-stepped. However, the comparison to the Wehrmacht end there. Ex-Nazi officers were either arrested or fled at the founding of the GDR to the West, who later established the Bundeswehr, the West German Army. This meant the founders of the NVR were mostly veterans of the anti-fascist resistance, international brigaders and Germans who served in the Red Army. So, whilst the NVR retained a distinctly German look, its politics and purpose were entirely different, whilst the West may have dropped the aesthetic, but retained and perpetuated the ideology of German militarism. The third characteristic was the idea of a hostile enemy and hatred of imperialism to supplement a love of socialism. This didn't mean a hatred of the people of the West, or even necessarily its culture, as it was perfectly legal to listen in to Western radio and television. In fact, 80% said they did so regularly. And Western music and fashion trends such as jeans became popular in the GDR, with products being produced internally. This hatred was instead directed at the capitalist states of the West and their imperialist policies. For example, the message, message was spread to expose that, quote, when Reagan speaks of peace, he means and practices war, destruction and murder. West Germany in particular was targeted by propaganda due to the shared culture between Germans and of course sharing a border. Attention was brought to the social struggles of the working class in the West, counteracting the Western propaganda of riches and prosperity. When students were rarely allowed to holiday, holiday in the West, they were often taken to the most run-down areas to show them the poverty the homelessness, the unemployment, issues which the capitalist system cannot and will not solve. This comparison was particularly striking when in the GDR, unemployment and homelessness had been a footnote in history for decades. The West was therefore shown and exposed to put profit before its own people, preferring to embezzle capitalists and put military might before the welfare of its own citizens. The system was and is barbaric and it was taught that it should be resisted at every step of the way. The final characteristic was proletarian internationalism, and it was very much an equal if not even more important factor to socialist patriotism. It was vital to balance out a patriotic culture with firm international commitments to avoid any development of national chauvinistic attitudes, that being a reversion to a reactionary form of patriotism and nationalism rather than the one that put the liberation of the international working class and peasants front and centre. The GDR aimed to commit itself to international affairs by both deeds and words. First, this was clear in rhetoric, as the international community was always mentioned before the GDR in official declarations and oaths of loyalty. As socialists, their commitment was to the worldwide socialist cause before the nation state. This commitment was cemented by frequent declarations of friendship with other nations, most notably the USSR and the other Warsaw Pact states, but especially to the nations in the Global South, such as Cuba, Vietnam, the DPRK, Mozambique, Angola, Mandela's ANC, Libya, Palestine, Yemen, Guinea, Algeria, Ethiopia, and countless others. 
Berlin was also home to the International Festival of Democratic Youth and saw young communists and progressives across the world flock to the GDR to exchange ideas and celebrate international solidarity. Angela Davies, the American revolutionary, was a welcome guest in the GDR several times. But simple statements could only go so far, as Lenin stated, quote, Internationalism lies not in fine phrases, nor in oaths of solidarity, nor in formal resolutions, but in deeds. And the GDR exemplified this. The GDR was second only to the USSR in its, in its commitments to foreign aid, exceeding 200 million marks per annum, sometimes even totaling 500 million. Their support to national liberation struggles was extensive, with struggles being reported in the press daily, as well as openly celebrated, for example by schools being named after freedom fighters such as Nelson Mandela. This was whilst the British government was calling for him to be hanged as a terrorist. The GDR printed papers and pamphlets for these groups to spread their ideas further afield. Doctors were dispatched to Vietnam, Angola and Mozambique, and students from these countries received offers to study for free in the GDR. Thousands of Vietnamese workers also emigrated to Berlin for work as well as many refugees from Chile following Pinochet's coup in 1973. The strength of the NVR as one of the best trained armies in the Warsaw Pact was utilised to assist in the fight against imperialism. Military instructors were sent to Guinea, Angola, Zimbabwe, Namibia, South Africa and Palestine to train the soldiers to the highest standard. This was often done side by side with Cuban revolutionaries. Numerous shipments of weapons and equipment were sent to, uh, sent to arm such groups and the FDA Yacht Work Brigades were dispatched to develop their industry and infrastructure with 60 such missions in 26 countries. Contrary to the image presented to us by the capitalists, the GDR was not closed off behind an iron curtain but was instead at the heart of the worldwide fight against imperialism and the capitalist system that perpetuated it. Its influence was so great that many countries of the Global South defied the West's vicious Halstein doctrine and recognising the GDR as a sovereign nation and a better friend to the oppressed peoples of the world than the imperialist West had ever, be, had ever been or could hope to be. When the wall fell and the proletarian internationalism was stripped from the consciousness of East Germans, it was blatantly clear that patriotism could be used for reactionary purposes. As the economy plummeted and the annexation by the West stripped East Germany of its industry, its social welfare and it tore up communities, the world was turned upside down. The left capitulated, leaving the road open to a resurgence of the far right. It was much easier for them to blame people's poverty on their former comrades and migrants from the third world than to point the finger at, supposed, at the supposedly perfect Western state that they'd just torn a wall down to join. The numbers of hate crimes grew fascist parties soared in popularity and we see this today with the Chemnitz marches, Pegida and the AFD being the third largest party in the Bundestag. Did the GDR's socialist patriotism play a role in this? Almost certainly. The ideas of pride in Germany that were fostered by the SED were thwarted for nefarious purposes, but this was a bastardised patriotism, one divorced from working class achievements, detached from anti-imperialism the values of proletarian internationalism and solidarity with the oppressed across the world. This was a withdrawal to the German patriotism of old, not the patriotism that built socialism and asserted the GDR as the friend of anti-imperialists across the world, which leaves us with a vital lesson. Patriotism can be used positively. It can be a tool in uniting the working class by pride in its own institutions and the society that it built by the sweat of its own brow but it can never be separated from the cause of the works of the world and the fight for the liberation of the oppressed, wherever they might be. I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank my patrons who, with their support, their very generous support, allow me to get some new resources for this video, which I didn't have before and hopefully made the content at least a little bit better. So without further ado, we have the ever faithful Held the Arbeit, we have a Woo and Deep Red Wine, we have our first ever pint man, um, is Dan Ball. I'm having pints tonight, so I'll be thinking of you whilst I'm drinking that. Uh, and of course, we have the party comrades as well. So we have Berrimans, we have Lemon Meringue uh, Kush, we have Martin Barakov, we have Sebastian Ribajic. Please do tell me if I'm saying that wrong, I probably butchered it. We have um, Simon Bilodeau Colbert. We have, and that is, yeah, I believe, 
Thank you for your support. It is very much appreciated, and I do hope you all enjoyed the video. Thank you, and I'll catch you at the next one. Solidarity, comrades.